with a show of hands, I want to know how many of you uses social media, as in Facebook and Twitter? Oh, that's it? I expected everyone. Well, we'll get back to that. But let me tell you a story. It was December 24th, 2003, in Erbil, Iraqi Kurdistan. It was just 10 days after Saddam Hussein's capture. I was just getting ready to go to school, and my mom was upstairs cleaning my brother's room. It was just a normal day until I suddenly heard a huge thunderstorm. It was a cold December in Erbil, so thunderstorms were not something unusual. So I remember after that, my ears started ringing and I couldn't hear anything. And then when I turned around, I saw broken glasses scattered across my room. And then I, I thought that this storm is so strong that it actually broke all of my windows at home. Anyways, I was 15 years old and I was really, really terrified. So I just ran out of my room and I started screaming, mom, mom, at the top of my lungs. All I wanted to hear back is my mom shouting back at me to, ma to make sure that she was okay. And then the relief came to me when I saw her on the stairs. And with it, my hearing improved. And then I started hearing sirens, car honks, people screaming with a distant lack of rain. That was the moment I realized that there was no thunderstorm. There was an explosion. When I made sure everybody was okay, I, I don't know, I had just this instinct, I had this feeling, I had this curiosity that I just wanted to go outside. Although I was just a 15-year-old female that shouldn't probably do that after an explosion, but I just had this curiosity to go outside. So I went outside, and that was when I was hit by the most shocking scene ever. Blood, bodies, smoke, complete chaos. Among us, the smoke, there was this eight-year-old boy who lay unconscious, covered in blood, with a school bag wrapped around him. He was probably on his way to another day of school, unaware that he would never make it. This scene will live with me forever. I still remember the scene at the back of my head every time, and I cannot forget the face and the look on that kid's face. Anyways, I went back inside, and out of nowhere, I just looked for my video camera. I took my video camera. Yet again, I'm this 15-year-old, curious, adventurous girl. I don't know why I took my video camera and just went outside to film what was going on. But I took my video camera and I went outside and I started recording, and I started filming what was happening outside my doorstep. There were people of the community helping the injured, helping the wounded. And there were, th not thousands, hundreds of taxi drivers and other drivers who were giving rides to the wounded one to the hospital. Now, this was one of the deadliest attacks Erbil has ever seen. Hundreds were injured, tens, were, tens died. The news across the world has covered this explosion. But what they did is they only talked about the mass casualties and, and the injuries. They failed to talk about the community that came together to help these people risking their own lives. That was a scene I could never, ever forget. And this is why. And I, and I, I still, that was the moment that I knew that I wanted to become a journalist. I wanted to become a reporter, someone who tells you the truth, someone who shows you and shows the entire world the real images, not only of the world, but about my country of Iraq. You see, you all, all of you watch the news, and all you can see is explosions and people dying. You really don't get the truth about what ha what's happening in Iraq. You see, I, lived, I lived in Iraq till 2009. I lived in Baghdad till 2007, and then two years in Erbil. And after that, I, I moved to the United States to pursue my career and study politics. I survived three wars, Iraq and Iran, the Gulf War, and the 2003 Iraq-US War. The, the explosion in Erbil was one of the first I have witnessed with my own eyes, but it definitely wasn't my last. When I returned to Baghdad with my family in 2004, I saw way more explosions. Uh, but not only that, I saw kidnappings, I saw shootings, I saw lootings, I saw murder, you name it, I pretty much saw it. 
it really became routine to me and for the city to witness such brutality on a daily basis. But even when violence is the norm, it is difficult not to be shocked by some events. For instance, one day me and my mom uh, were in the kitchen talking about school and she was like telling me how bad I was at school, uh, every mom. And uh, then we saw this scene, a driver at the wheel and then a woman next to the driver's seat and two kids at the back of the car. Uh, they were probably just a normal family going home, driving home, when suddenly two gunned men stopped the car and they started shooting, before they started shooting the driver, they told the family to get out of the car and ran as, fa as far as they can from the car. So they started shooting the man and they probably shot him more than 10 times and then grabbed his body, laid him on the street, just across from where my mom and I were standing. My mom and I's reaction was just like, what just happened? We didn't have words to say with each other. We wanted to help, but we couldn't help. We wanted to call the cops, but then we were worried we might get in trouble. So I just went back to my room and I wrote what happened in my diary. The next day I woke up and I saw the body exactly where it was left, covered in a white sheet. I remember our neighbor was visiting and I asked him, what the heck happened yesterday? Why is nobody helping this? Why is nobody moving this dead man's body? He simply responded, he was a Ba'athist, which means he was somehow loyal to the Saddam Hussein regime. But I am a Ba'athist too, not because I chose to, or support or supported the, 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 the regime, but because at one point in Iraq, we all had to be Ba'athist. For instance, at school, they told me I am obliged to join the Ba'ath party and sign the paperwork for it, or else I won't be able to go to high school. So there you go, we were all Ba'athist in Iraq. And don't be surprised, we lived under a dictatorship. Anyways, my neighbor continues, we cannot help this poor dead man. We must leave him where he is until somebody comes and picks his body. For the next three days, I saw this dead man's body lay down in the street. The police passed by and didn't help. The army passed by and didn't do anything. Eventually, the body was removed, but I didn't know who or what time of the day or what time, or what time of the day or night that happened. But that was the moment when I realized why nobody helped him. Why didn't the news say anything about this guy who was just outside of my door, dead for three days and nobody offered to help? They were covering all the explosions about the US Army and whatnot. And then I started thinking, why the people didn't say anything? Why didn't they help? Why didn't I help? Why wasn't I capable of helping? Why my country, Iraq, is so effed up and inhuman that we cannot help a dead man, like we cannot help a dead man? You see, Iraq dream dreamed about freedom and democracy for the longest time. And when we finally got the freedom and democracy we've dreamed of, it all went downhill for two main problems. Problem one, on June 3rd, 2003, debathification was enforced, which was the process of removing the members and the influence of the Ba'ath party from the public office. This campaign marginalized the Ba'athists. They surely faced difficulties in integrating in the society. So these people, couldn't have jobs, these people didn't have jobs. These people were labeled as murderers, even the ones who were Ba'athist by name, like me. So what do you think the alternative for these people were? Of course, obviously create their own oppositional parties and or join terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and what we see today as ISIS. You see, that was one of, one of the many problems that the media lacked on reporting. Problem two, the Secretarian War that we still witness it today in Iraq. And then it started in 2004, literally after the first free elections in Iraq. And that was the spark of it all. The Shiites been in, had been oppressed for the longest time. The Sunnis were the superiors for more than four decades. Now the Shiites are in power the Sunnis feel marginalized and they started looking for their own alternatives. This, this fight over power and money became more important than religious identities living together under one roof. You may ask me, how do you know that these, uh, these sects are able to live with each other? Because I remember Iraq I lived in, which was 
before the war, yes, we lived under a dictatorship, but I didn't see any fingers being pointed at me. I am Kurdish. So nobody, told, nobody cared and nobody told me if I'm Kurdish, Muslim, Sunni, Christian, whatever it is, nobody told me that until the 2003 war happened and everybody started pointing fingers at me. That was also one of the problems, but my happy moment was when I went to Michigan, which is uh, where the, most of Iraqi population resides in the US. It was a very happy moment for me because I saw Iraq the way I lived in it before. When I met these Iraqis, I met Sunnis and Shiites, you know, they, they were getting along just fine, you know, they even have political conversations and they don't even have to kill each other. So, you know, these people, they work together, they laugh together, they got married also to each other, the Sunnis and the Shiites, they actually call them sushi in, <laughs> in Michigan. <laughs> So you see, that was the moment I realized that my country, the problem is not with, my, with the people of my country, the problem is not with the Iraqi people, the problem is with the ones that lead the country. This division is one of the major reasons why the Islamic State exists today. Of course, by Islamic State, I mean ISIS, and you're all aware of the situation in Iraq and Syria. ISIS intelligent members are ex bathists Critics did argue that the policy of debathification was not only undemocratic, but it's also one of the major reasons why the situation, why the, the security situation throughout Iraq is as it is today. Guess what? Ah, they were right. I don't blame Islam for creating the Islamic State. I blame poverty. I blame lack of freedom. I blame the present government in failing to bring people together and letting them just look for such violent alternatives. If you think for a second, ISIS is Islamic, think again. Islam is as religious as any other mainstream religion, like Judaism and like Christianity. You know, we all have radicals in those and we all have moderate in those. ISIS itself does un-Islamic things for the name of a Sunni caliphate state. They are po political rather than religious. Today, ISIS is all over the news. But I believe there is a way that we can get rid of them. At least that's what I think as a journalist. But before we get into that, I want to tell you that not all of the stories I have said is that dark about Iraq. We do have a happy story. Take Kurdistan, for example. It is where I am from. I am Kurdish and I am proud to stand here today and to say I am Kurdish because it is the silver lining of the 2003 war. Today, Kurdistan is the home for over two million refugees from different religions, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. Kurds themselves, they faced oppression, they faced torture, and they also faced genocide for more than two decades by the Saddam Hussein regime. They were afraid to live with the Arabs. They were afraid to mix up with any other backgrounds and ethnicities. But guess what? They got over it. Kurdistan today is the other Iraq, where people live in, live in peace and prosperity. It is also the home for so many foreigners who invest and work in the country. Kurdistan yet is another example that unification in Iraq is possible under a fair political system. The one that doesn't include practicing democracy and freedom and chaos and be divided on it. Today, I am a journalist in Washington, D.C., and I kept, keep ad addressing these issues. I keep telling people about it because I know that us Iraqis are able to work with each other, are able to make Iraq unified again because I lived under it. Yes, it was under a dictatorship, but nobody, like I said, was pointing fingers at me. It is this power now and the fight over power and who wants to be president, who wants to be prime minister, 
is the reason why my country is like that. If unification is possible in Kurdistan and major cities in the United States, why it isn't possible in Iraq, the, people, the, the place where these people are from? I found this one solution, which is what I asked you about earlier, social media. Today, social media is one of the biggest and the most powerful tools that we have. Social media was able to bring thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people together. Take, for example, the 2010 Arab Spring. It didn't only bring people together, no. It brought down dictatorship in Egypt and Tunisia. And yes, they tried in Syria, but they failed. But at least the people gathered up together and went to the square to fight for their freedom. And they haven't done that in more than five decades. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of Facebook pages that call for unification and peace, not only in Iraq, but everywhere around the world. And most of these pages, most of these Facebook pages are created by young activists, perhaps, perhaps like some of you in the audience. And they also want to end bloodshed and terror. Social media was also able, just a week ago, to bring about 3.7 million people and friends together. This is a worldwide war. Not the kind involving guns, but the kind involving words. We are all in combat today, online. We try to bring people together. And in doing so, we come together. Many of the Charlie Hebdo images show a pen expressing freedom of expression. Now, I am a Muslim journalist, a Kurdish Iraqi reporter, and I want to share my pen with all of you. This is the age of social warfare. And I know unity is possible if we become one. I know you can help my country to be unified again if you get online and bring those people together. So join me today in social warfare without bloodshed. But before I leave you, who here wants a special souvenir? Nobody wants a special souvenir? Oh, come on, I want to give you a souvenir. All right, uh, sir, this is my pen, and I've, I'm gonna throw it to you. All right, you got it. This pen has been my friend for over 12 years. Actually, more than that, since I started writing my diaries, and I wrote my diaries in English, although English is not my first language, it's my third. Um, so this has been my friend for the longest time and I will keep writing, I will keep fighting in my writing to unify my country again, but to bring people together again. But this is not only the last one, because I have a spare one too, and I will keep writing. Thank you very much.